It's here. Intel's long-awaited 11th generation i9, sporting a 19% IPC improvement, all new Cypress Cove cores, higher boost clocks and faster 3200MHz memory support out of the box, and PCI Gen 4 support too. And that 19% number isn't just marketing either. In my testing with single-threaded tests like Cinebench R20, it's 24% faster than the last gen 10 850K that I bought to test against. That translates to multi-core loads too, again in Cinebench where... Oh. It's slower. Yeah. Why? Well, there's a dirty little secret. Last year's i9 offered 10 cores and 20 threads. But this year's? Just eight. Oof. The reason for the lower core count on this newer chip, in the end, comes down to power draw. This CPU, while rendering in Blender, using the pre-configured PL1 and PL2 figures that CyberPower preset and that many motherboards will use by default, it choked down 267 watts. And using the new boost option, spiked that to a shocking 310 from an 8 core. Anantec reckons that a 32 core Threadripper draws less power than this desktop 8 core. You might be asking, why and how? Well, let me explain. Intel has been, for lack of a better word, stuck on their 14 nanometer process since technically Broadwell, although those weren't you know, mass market sold, so Skylake or sixth generation is really where it was at, but either way, that was the last six years. They've been trying over and over and over again to get their 10 nanometer process off the ground, and they are shipping some 10 nanometer CPUs, mostly low power mobile chips, as reports suggest that their main issue is running any more than a few watts through that new silicon. A far cry from the 300 that this thing needs. So they did the next best thing. All of their CPUs from the 6th to the 10th generation are all based on the same basic core design. And you could argue it was even longer than that, but either way, since Intel has been doing so much work to design new CPUs for that new 10 nanometer process, well, they're gonna use those new designs, but backport them to work on the larger 14 nanometer. At this point, I should make it clear that 14 nanometer, 10 nanometer, 7 nanometer don't really mean anything anymore. They used to measure the size of the transistors, they used to be a physical measurement of actually, well, measuring something, but nowadays, it's more of marketing, it's more kind of baseless, and it's more of a, we made some changes, we made them smaller, and so we're gonna call it something slightly different. Intel's 14 nanometer has a pretty similar uh, estimated peak density or transistor density to TSMC's 10 nanometer, and Intel's 10 nanometer matches, or actually technically exceeds TSMC's seven, which is what AMD is currently using. But that's kind of the point, isn't it? Because AMD has been using TSMC's 7 nanometer process since Ryzen 3000 and is due to move to TSMC's 5 nanometer process next year with Zen 4. Meanwhile, Intel is playing catch up as their current chip, the one that's launching today, has less than half the estimated peak density of AMD's current and past ones. And even if the 12th generation chips do run Intel's 10 nanometer process, AMD will be leapfrogging them to 71% more dense at the same time. And all of that puts Intel on the back foot here. And having to upscale their new designs to run on the larger process node means less efficiency than expected and more power drop. When you combine that with the now higher boost clocks and when using the adaptive boost technology, which is up to 5.1 gigahertz on all cores, it's a recipe for disaster or a fire hazard. Now you've likely already seen the pre-launch reviews of the 11700K and know that the i7 is also an eight core and 16 thread chip. So what makes the i9 so special? 
Well, as is the Intel way, they've basically hamstrung the i7's boost characteristics, including disabling thermal velocity boost and not allowing you to use the new adaptive boost technology either, so you're stuck with the standard Turbo Boost 2.0, 3.0 and all core figures. What does that mean? Well, the max that the i7 will hit is 5 GHz on a single core and up to 4.6 GHz on all cores, whereas the i9 can hit 5.3 GHz on single core and up to 5.1 on all cores when using ABT. In theory, that means that i9 can be around 10% faster in all core workloads and around 6% faster in single thread, which actually bears out as in Cinebench, again quoting against the Anantec 11700K review, uh, with single thread it was around 6% faster in the real world, although in multi-thread it wasn't quite as close to the theoretical around 7% faster. Unfortunately, when you start to compare it to its peers, namely the Ryzen 9 5900X and 5800X as well, which I I also bought to test against, well it's not the prettiest of pictures. Again, in Cinebench R20 in single threaded, the new 11900K pretty much matches both Ryzen chips and that's with every boost setting turned on. In all core, without ABT enabled, it's actually, the, it's actually slower than the last gen i9 thanks to its two less cores and four less threads and slower than the Ryzen 7 5800X, but with ABT enabled it does pull ahead of both the 10850K and the 5800X, but those aren't its price competitors. The 5900X is, and even with ABT enabled, the 5900X is 34% faster. In a more real world well, application of that, in Blender with shorty, uh, shorter, burstier workloads, it can see a reasonable advantage over the 5800X in things like the BMW scene, as with ABT enabled, the new i9 is 11 seconds faster to render the scene, although the old i9 is a further 12 seconds faster than that. And the 5900X? Well, that's just a bloodbath. It's 32 seconds faster, or 26%. Ouch. In longer workloads, it's even tougher, as even with a massive 360mm AO running full blast, it peaked at 101 degrees Celsius, even without ABT enabled. And with it enabled, well, it jumps to 101 degrees Celsius instantly and then stays there for the duration of any CPU intensive test. In the Gooseberry render, the new i9 is actually the slowest on the field, even with ABT enabled. The old i9 beats it by 5%, and remember that that i9 isn't exactly power efficient either, peaking at 203 watts in the same test and 84 degrees Celsius with the same cooler. The 5800X also beats it, although by a much slimmer margin, but the real one winner here is the 12 core 5900X, which is an astonishing 40% faster, around four minutes. If you wanted to render 30 seconds of that scene at just 30 FPS, it would take the i9 60 hours longer than the 5900X. Well, that isn't exactly realistic, it gives you an idea of the performance delta. Intel does claw back an advantage with the Adobe CC suites, with apps including uh, Premiere, After Effects, and Photoshop, trading blows well with the 1500X in the Puget Bench suite. It struggles in Premiere a little bit more thanks to the slower rendering power compared to the 12 core Ryzen, but gains an advantage in After Effects, especially since a lot of the plugins that the test uses can be a little bit more single thread oriented and likely still pretty heavily Intel optimized. Photoshop has the same sort of results where the new i9 edges ahead a little bit, again thanks to those filters and plugins working a little bit better on that i9. But but Andrew, it's, it's a gaming CPU and gaming happens with Intel. I mean, sure, but it also happens with ARM and AMD, so uh, yeah. Either way, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't test out some games on this thing, so let's take a look. Now, I'm using the RTX 3080 uh, that was provided in this CyberPower system, which you can check out in the link below, by the way. It's not an affiliate link. Feel free to take a look. 
but uh, for all of the CPUs, I'm testing with the, the same you know, GPU, rather obviously. I'm also testing with the same memory as well, as it's running a 3200 megahertz kit. I'm also testing at both 1080p, as that's where we're most likely to see performance differences, but also 1440p, as if you're spending 500 pounds on a CPU, you sure as hell aren't playing at 1080p, unless you're playing on a 360Hz monitor, and then, you know, fair enough. Starting with Watch Dogs Legion, on ultra settings, as are all of these games, at 1080p, they're really remarkably close. They're all within a couple of FPS of each other, close enough to call it well within margin of error. From slowest to fastest is only a 4 FPS gap, so while technically the new i9 is on top of the charts, it's not what I would call a convincing lead. At 1440p, the story is much the same. This time with the old i9 being the, the one getting that one FPS extra to push it to the top of the graph. But again, in reality, you are not going to notice any playing experience difference at both 1080p and at 1440p in this game with this setup. In Cyberpunk 2077, a game that in my previous testing can be pretty CPU bottlenecked and CPU bound, at least on lower end hardware, well, it's much the same as Watch Dogs here. The gap from slowest to fastest is slightly bigger, around six or eight FPS, with the new i9 taking a slightly more reasonable lead, although still only by a couple of frames. Interestingly, the 1% lows do tell a slightly different story, indicating that the playing experience might not be quite as good on the older i9 or either of the Ryzen's, although I can't say that I noticed that difference while running those benchmarks. At 1440p, the gap remains pretty similar with the, the new and old i9's and the 1500X all being well, well within margin of error and run-to-run -run variation, and honestly, the 5800X probably fit, fits in there too. Again, the 1% lows do tell a slightly different story, this time with the new i9 coming out ahead. In COD Modern Warfare, at 1080p, it's back to anyone's guess. The performance gap between them is close enough that I genuinely couldn't tell you which one of them I'd be playing on at any given point. There's a 6 FPS gap all in, and technically, again, the new i9 is actually the slowest, but again, I wouldn't put much weight on that. Uh, the same goes for 1440p, where there really isn't much that I can say or add to this beyond leave the chart up for a second or two longer so you can pause if you're interested. And lastly for me, Fortnite. This one does show a bit more of a gap between the older 10850K and the new 11900K, with the new chip being around 15 FPS faster on average. Interestingly though, both the 58 and 5900X Ryzen chips are a hair faster than the 11900K, although Fortnite is a game with incredibly wide performance swings, so your in-game performance would end up being incredibly similar across the board and across all three, if not all four. At 1440p though, it all smooths out again with only an absolute maximum of 6 FPS between slowest and fastest, which is again reasonably covered under run to run variation and within margin of error. So it's perhaps a hair faster than the old chip in gaming, and at 1080p ultra settings anyway. It does technically pit for the Ryzen chips to the post most of the time, although the margins are so slim that you wouldn't ever know. So to wrap things up, the 11900K is just about as fast as last year's i9, although draws anywhere between 30 and 50% more power while doing so, runs at 101 degrees Celsius, even with a massive 360ml water cooler, and is marginally faster in gaming. On average, it's 14% slower across the board than the 5900X, all while drawing 118% more power. And all for the same price. My conclusion? Don't buy this. If you do want to go for an 8-core Intel chip, then the i7 looks like a much better option, offering pretty comparable performance, including in games, but a little less power hungry and a fair bit lighter on your wallet. If you just want a game, the 11600K that I should have a review of later on this week, it looks to be a lot better 
of a, a value proposition, as does the new 11400, which I'll hopefully be checking out soon as well. If you're willing to drop £500 plus on a CPU though, the 1500X from AMD performs better across the board and is much, much less of a space heater too. A few final bits of information that didn't quite fit anywhere else. Um, I, I tested the 11900K on three different BIOS versions, uh, each with different uh, microcode updates, and they performed pretty differently, so there's still uh, there's probably some more performance and optimizations to be had as we go forward. Uh, when using the Adaptive Boost, I experienced a lot of instability and blue screens. It's definitely not stable yet, at least on this Z590 Carbon uh, that came in this CyberPower system. I did also run some fully stock numbers with no power level modifications. That was a fair bit slower, around 100 points less in Cinebench R20 multi-thread, although thanks to the overheating issue, it offered pretty much the same performance in anything longer than a minute or two. The CyberPower system itself is pretty well built, definitely nicely cable managed, comes with all of the accessories and extra cables in the box, which I really like. Uh, the one thing I would mention is that they only plugged in a single 8-pin EPS CPU power connector of the two that the motherboard have ha has available. And considering this chip can draw a peak of 314 watts in my testing, I'm not very comfortable using a single 8-pin for that. It's very close to the, the theoretical limit of 7 amps per 4 positive wires there, so uh, I would like to see both of those plugged in for customer systems. Also, only having 16 gigabytes of RAM in a system of this price tag, just shy of three grand, and this caliber doesn't really make sense to me. Of course, you can customize that on CyberPower's website, so feel free to take a look at that link below. Uh, I would caution you, if you're planning on upgrading the RAM, it's probably best to keep it under 3200 megahertz, or around there, because that is the maximum uh, supported or in spec frequency that Intel will allow you to still have a warranty on your CPU for. If you pick something like 3600 megahertz, then technically speaking, the second you enable that, you void your CPU's warranty. Oh, and the storage configuration of this feels a little weird. It has a 500 gig a Samsung 980 Pro, and then a two terabyte hard drive. You can mix and match the storage configuration on their site so you can have two Gen 3 NVMe SSDs instead and both one terabyte drives for I think around 50 pounds more and I would much rather have that than some spinning rust and a relatively small drive for being the primary. And lastly, if you're planning on using one of these new 11th gen chips on a Z490 board, that is possible with a BIOS update. Uh, I want to make it clear though that because the top M.2 slot on the Z590 boards is now directly connected to the CPU, much like they have on Ryzen chips and, and boards, uh, you do now have full PCI Gen 4 support with both the new chip and a new Z590 board, but on an old one, well, none of those uh, are none of those M.2 slots that you'll have on those boards are directly connected to the CPU, nor will they support PCIe Gen 4. And if you're planning on using a 10th Gen chip in a new Z590 board, then it's very likely that the top M.2 slots won't work for you because again, it's directly connected to the CPU, and those 10th Gen chips aren't wired for that. So I think that's a good roundup of my my thoughts, experiences, and the, the benchmark numbers of the new 11900K. I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. What do you think of this new chip? Is this something you'd pick up yourself? Would you go for one of the lower tier ones or go for Ryzen instead? Feel free to let me know in those comments down below. I'll also be leaving a link to both the CyberPower system and the CPU directly in the description, so feel free to take a look at those. And that's pretty much it from me. If you want to see more videos like this one on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday basis, including that uh, 11, 9, uh, 600K review coming up later this week, and hopefully the 11400 as well, then hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon so you don't miss those videos. And there is a load of other links in the description you can check out, from merch or hoodies to t-shirts like this one, or a load of other cool designs. There's also a Patreon for access to our Money Men Discord chat, supporting me directly and sponsor for videos, and you help me pay for CPUs to bench against. Um, other than that, that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching. Check out some more videos on the end cards, and we'll see you all in the next video.